talked about it last episode and here is the trade well kind of the trade idea that i had that i think would really shake up the team and it would be for andre iguodala i'll talk about it in a sec because we also have a few other trade ideas to go through as well i was looking at a guy like jimmy butler and you kind of get the idea with what type of player i'm looking at i want someone to fill that avery bradley role that we're going to be missing for probably the really like the hood is the entire season but he does have a chance of coming back late in the year. Aaron Aflalo would be kind of a lesser version of that. He's actually kind of low overall in this game, even though he's a really good player in real life. It's only 74 overall in this game. But anyway, this game or this episode are going up against the Atlanta Hawks. And yes, I know it's another away game. We played them like two weeks ago at home. But the reason I wanted to wait two weeks is because Rajon Rondo was out another like one to two weeks. And yes, Rajon Rondo is on the Hawks now. And uh, that's why I wanted to play them. But he's still out this game. He's not going to be in it. So that's too bad. But yes, Rajon Rondo did sign with the Hawks. They still have Al Horford. They have Rodney Hood now. They have a pretty good team. Paul Millsap and Lou Williams also in the starting lineup. So it's a really, really good team. Really formidable team. They're 16 and 21. I think if they had Rondo, though, they would be uh, they'd have a bit higher of a record. It seemed like Rondo's been out for a little bit now, but nonetheless, they do have Jeff Teague starting a point guard instead of him, and Jeff Teague is a fine player. So. They should be okay, but let me talk about those trade ideas that I had. You get the idea of what the type of player I'm looking for. I'm looking for a D and three type of shooting guard. Uh, the first guy, Andre Iguodala, would be my my prime target. He's pretty much a better version of what I want out of Avery Bradley. I want defense and I want three pointers. And Iguodala is not the greatest three point shooter in the world, but he is a good three point shooter in the game. He's actually having a good year from deep for the Warriors this year, so. I wouldn't be too worried about him being any worse of a shooter than Bradley was. Uh, he'd cost a little bit. The way I'm thinking it is I could look to deal any combination of Marcus Page and Jalil Okafor. Um, if I, you know, let's say I pack, I package them together. That's, I don't know, what, four or five, six million dollars in salary or something. I'd have to throw in another small level contract. And I could probably get some sort of asset back from the Warriors as well. Because that is uh, basically two first round picks for Iguodala, which is a little bit of an overpay, I would say. Well, no, 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 Iguodala is a very, very good player, but either way, it's not important. Uh, but what it would do is it would also solidify our bench a little bit. There's, you know, I guess you can't really be too deep, but in a sense, you can't have too many guys. You don't want guys, you know, coming off the bench, getting less minutes than they should, and, and you know, being frustrated about it and having that affect team chemistry and all that stuff. But uh, that would kind of solidify our top eight being uh, our starting five, which would, which would be Eric Bledsoe, Andre Iguodala, um, Jawari Parker, Jared Sollinger, and Roy Hibbert, and then off the bench, our top three would be Alan Pierce and Omar Ashik, and then after that, you could fiddle around with some other guys, but that would kind of solidify our top eight. We'd probably have to look at another backup big man, but what that, all, that also like allows us to do is potentially go small ball with Pierce in the starting lineup, which I would not be opposed to, because we do have Giannis Atentacumbo and Tayshaun Prince who can take some of Pierce's bench minutes, and then we, if we take Sollinger and put him off the bench, that uh, that gives us three rotation big men if you don't count Parker, which is basically you want kind of four rotation big men. Um, maybe three, you can get away with three, but you would ideally want four unless you're going to go with the small ball lineup at some point. Um, and then obviously we'd have Norris Cole too. He could be our full-time backup point guard. So I kind of like the team, what we, the, uh, the idea of the team when we do that type of trade. So I think that's what I'm going to be going for. If I can't pull that off, I might try to pull a smaller scale deal for a guy like Jimmy Butler or something like that. But let me know what you guys do think. Of kind of getting someone to replace that Avery Bradley role. Now, Bradley is due back in two to four months, and it's only January, so there is a chance that it comes back in March with like six weeks to play in the season, which might be a little bit of a dilemma for all this, which is why if I do decide to pull off a trade like this, I'm going to be waiting until the last second right at the deadline because I want to know exactly when Avery Bradley is coming back before I pull off this type of trade. If I'm going to get him back with six weeks left in the regular season, then I'm not going to worry about it because I know when he comes back, our, our team is going to be solidified and guys are going to go back to their regular roles and you know they're, they're going to go back to being to playing what they were brought here to play instead of having kind of these weird starting lineup combinations and all that but anyway um if he if he's not due back till may then i know i got to make a move and uh, i'll make some sort of move like getting a jimmy butler and andre Godala. but nonetheless in this ball game we're down by nine jabari parker trying to drive in on rodney hood the former duke teammate parker's gonna fade on him and switch that home nice baseline fade away over the back right there but elden brand yes that is still elden brand a captain of the keep getting them checks all-star team making or actually making the pass to Rodney Hood for the for the jumper right there and now Rodney Hood with the ball into that move giving it off to Lo Lewis Williams Lou Williams I almost called him Mo Williams making the jumper and now it's an 11 point lead for the Hawks we're trying to get up to 40 points before the half Allen coming off the screen doing what he does best hitting the jump shot and that's going to make it a nine point game but here's Al Horford who's going to put it up no good and that is going to end off the half you're down by nine and Doris Burke is standing by gentlemen I'm here with Roy Hibbert and Roy what do you think the team needs to do 
coming up in the second half? I think we need to take care of the ball on the offensive end, um, get back, but um, you got to do a better job of just controlling the pace of the game. You know, you give a little bit of leeway, but uh, I think we can do a better job in that aspect. Roy, as always, we appreciate the time. Gentlemen, back to you. So getting things started here in the second half, we were down by nine. Bledsoe looking for that screen from Hibbert. Nice bounce pass right there, and Hibbert's going to posterize Paul Millsap right there. That's going to make it a seven-point lead now, down to a five-point game. Eric Bledsoe with the ball. He's got a mismatch, but he's going to kick it back out to Sollinger, who is automatic from that elbow jumper. And the lead is down to three. The Celtics are getting right back in this ball game. Here comes Pierce on the break, taking it right to the hoop, taking in the contact, and getting that one in over Lou Williams. Nice shot right there from the savvy veteran, of course. Now Al Horford driving, kicking to low Lou Williams. I keep trying to call him Low Williams. Lou Williams for the three, knocking it down. Now Jeff Teague with the ball, trying to drive in. Kicks it out. Lou Williams once again, same spot, knocking down the three, and the Hawks have opened up the lead once again. It's an eight-point game. Shelvin Mack with the ball driving in, crossing it over, putting it up and putting it in right over our defense. Now a 12-point lead. The Hawks have opened up their old lead, but here we go. Driving and kicking to Ray Allen for the contested three, and he knocks it down, the greatest three-point shooter of all time. Getting one to go. And now a bad turnover right here. Dennis Schroeder driving in, and it is good. So the Hawks regain the 10-point lead. And this is where the game has kind of been hovering around all the all game long, really. Kind of this 10-point-ish lead. Now John Jenkins sighting. That is a John Jenkins sighting. He hits the three, and it's a 13-point lead. Now Schroeder driving in, stepping back. This time it's Jared Cunningham, who was recently waived, but he gets the three to go. And that's going to make it 76-60. to 60. A 16-point game. Allen, step back, Jay. No good. And we're going to go into the fourth and final quarter of this ball game. Down by 16. We were down by 10, but a couple quick threes from the Hawks really opened this lead up. And 16, being down 16 with 12 minutes to play is, feels a lot worse than being down 10 with 12 minutes to play. But we'll see what we can do. So here we're still down by 16. Lou Williams with the ball driving in on Eric Bledsoe. You see I was trying to adjust my defense here. That kind of gets me caught off guard. And that's going to allow Lou Williams to get the easy layup to go. So here we go. Nice ball movement right here. Getting it to Roy Hibbert for the pick and pop jumper. He's going to knock it down. The lead's back down to 16. But here we go. The Hawks coming back once again. Horford's blocked by Hibbert, but it's saved. Kicked out to Rodney Hood, and Hood's going to put it in. So it's up to 18 once again. The Hawks seem like they're about to pull away from this game if they haven't already. But, you know, conceivably the Celtics could still come back. The Hawks are trying to put it away. Six and a half minutes to play. A 19-point game. Bledsoe with the ball up to Pierce. Driving in. He will slam it down with one hand and cut it back down to 17. But here come the Hawks on the other end. Next possession, Lou Williams with the ball. Five and a half to play in the game. Coming around that screen. And Pierce could not catch up with them. Williams lazing it off the glass. Making it a 19-point lead. Now Hibbert on the other end. Finding... The size advantage here. He's going to give it off to Eric Bledsoe, though, who finishes that layup strong. Nice finish right there by Bledsoe, finishing that one over the big man. Now we got the ball back. Down by 17. Hibbert to the lane. Left-handed layup down by 15. So here come the Celtics trying to mount the run. But Hawks on the other end. Lou Williams with the ball. Nice escape dribble to the three-point line, pulling up in Paul Pierce's face. And that was pretty much how the game went all day long. We would get a run going, get a couple offensive baskets, but we couldn't get the defensive stops when it counted. And our offense really struggled today. Only 75 points through basically three and three quarters. Three and three and two-thirds of a quarter or something like that. That's what I was trying to say. But and really, that's where we that's where our downfall was today. I don't know what it was. You know, I mean, it's a better offensive team than we had last year. And I don't really feel like we ever struggled this badly on offense. It might be it was the turn, maybe it was the turnovers. I mean, I think the team stats will uh, maybe shed some light on that. But 20-point lead for the Hawks. And I was kind of digging around in this last minute or so. As you can see, I'm taking it through Jalil Okafor. And I took like three threes with Roy Hibbert because I knew we were going to lose. So I just feel like, let's have fun. But anyway, uh, Doris Burke, once again, standing by. Well, Paul, congratulations on this win. It seemed like this game was getting away from you at points. What does the team take away from this game in terms of experience? You know, we got to do a better job of executing down the stretch. You know, as simple as that. Um, we're just glad we got this win. We just can't let these things happen in the future. In escape from some mistakes, Paul. Well done, guys. All right. So that's going to do it, a 22-point loss, a very tough loss. And it's been that kind of season for the Celtics. You know, good team, but don't think we really fulfilled our expectations. So much talent on this roster, and I feel like we are uh, a move away kind of at the trade deadline from maximizing that talent. And maybe that move is just picking Avery Bradley back up when he comes back from his injury. But we'll see. Lou Williams, 29-8-6. That's a, that's a product of us just not having enough defense at that two-guard position. So anyway, take a look at the stats. Looks like the turnovers did us in. We had 17 turnovers, and looks like Eric Bledsoe had six of them. So that's definitely what killed us on offense today. 
Parker did have 12. Pierce had 19. But other than that, mm, kind of so-so games from a lot of people. Will Williams killed us all game long. Millsap at 14 and 7. And you see Brandon Horford got some rebounds in too. Anyway, that's going to do it for me. I do want to thank you guys for watching. Hope you did enjoy. And so I'm out. Peace.